I started with by sharing with you that there are several definitions of a dispensation which exists, and I shared with you the, that what we call an economy, an economy is a period of time, and this particular economy is a period of time which represents what God is going to be doing during a period of time. I told you that they sometimes call this an age, and I explained to you that it is a period which is divided in the scripture into seven periods or seven dispensations. And then I shared with you that, that the rest of that is your reading and, and uh, we finally reached over to the, to the point where there are seven dispens dispensations mentioned in the scriptures and they can be identified as innocence, conscience, government, promise, law, grace, and millennial kingdom. Can you all see that part? All right. Some of you will know what I'm talking about as I go on. But a dispensation begins with a divine appointment and ends with a divine judgment. And you can only handle this as a believer if you are completely into a literal interpretation of the Bible. And as you know, I'm an ultra-liberalist. I believe every bit of God's word is true. Let's do the first four dispensations. And the first four, as you see there, are unique to in that they precede Moses and the writing of the Bible. You see where I'm at? And consequently, not much is given about the first four pre-Mosaic dispensations. And the obvious reason is because we didn't have any writing going on that we would rely upon for what it was all about. There was no court reporter in the Garden of Eden, folks. There was no biographer in the Garden of Eden. And so, the scripture mainly deals, your Bible mainly deals with the last three dispensations of law, grace, and kingdom. The first dispensation begins with a comprehensive view of God's great plan for eternity to eternity. You see that? Each dispensation begins with God placing man in a new position in his relationship to God. And each dispensation ends with man failing God. And it results in God's judgment on man. And all of you can, since your Bible scholars understand exactly what I'm talking about, some of you know even when they occurred, we're going to look at them. This divine testing demonstrates the failure of man and his sinful nature. And the results of these starts and stops results in demonstrations of dispensation. What the, you want to get from each dispensation is, is that the it exhibits God's grace, which he keeps extending in each of these periods to mankind. And so, let us look at the first dispensation. The first one is called innocence, and this period of dispensation of innocence begins with, with the promise of a redeemer. 
And the period of time in this dispensation begins with the creation of man and goes through to his expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Can you see that that would be a period of time? Can you see also that that was the age of innocence, as one would call it? So the rule of life in the first dispensation was that of innocence. Adam and Eve were to follow God in obedience and accept the responsibility to do what God entrusted them to do. What was that? Tend the garden. Stay in the garden. What else? Be fruitful. And what? Multiply. Take care of the animals. Name them. You all with me? All right. They only had one prohibition. What was it? Don't eat of that fruit of the tree of knowledge. But who doesn't want to be smart? You know? They all, we all would have had to take another look at that tree. So that is why it's in us. We got it. We inherited it. They failed the test. And God intervened on their behalf. How? With grace. A sacrifice of blood shed for their redemption. God's judgment demands death for all mankind because of man's nature and relationship with God in the first dispensation. If you eat of this tree, you will die. Okay, the individuals involved in this period are who? Adam and Eve. They were to follow God's instructions completely and would have had everything they ever needed to enjoy life forever. For this first dispensation, if you're looking for it, the scriptures which apply to it are from Genesis 1, 26 through Genesis 3, 6. Got it? That's a dispensation. That's the first one. The second dispensation is that of conscience. It's a period of time after Eden when no apparent rules were given to Adam and Eve. They were banned from the garden, driven out of the garden. He would have had to make me leave too. You understand what, what the text said there? It said they were driven from the garden. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't... Mm -hmm. They were to follow the dictates of their conscience. And this dispensation of conscience is a revealing of the need for a blood sacrifice offering. And this is shown in the sacrifice made by Abel. And Cain demonstrated his depravity and man's when he refused to provide the proper sacrifice. God told those two boys, this is what I want. And one of them decided he'd do what he wanted to do. Sounds like man, doesn't it? You got a couple of people. God says, this is the way I'll save you. One says, I'll take that. The other one says, I can't believe it. Human nature. Of course, you know that story. Cain, in his depravity, killed his brother. This period of time was between Adam and Eve's covenant with God and the flood, which God delivered over the entire world. In this period of time... There is sinfulness, there is physical death because of man's depravity, and the rule of life of, of conscience was difficult. It was easy to recognize the bidding of the conscience, but hard to live up with the, the sin nature present in man. Yes, we need to do what God wants us to do, but The depravity of Cain and his descendants failed God's test. 
some of those involved in this time of testing who escaped God's judgment because of his grace were Enoch and Noah's family. They received salvation because they trusted God. Y'all know Enoch? Enoch walked with God and was no more. We all know how Noah got off this planet. Got, got, got a new sea voyage. He took a boat. What? Yeah. About 900 some years old. So this, they received salvation because they trusted God. This is Noah and his family. The second dispensation of scripture which applies is this, is that Genesis chapter 3 verse 7 through Genesis 8, 19. Getting a better idea of dispensations? And see, because of the time spans, it's difficult to call it ages. It's difficult to call it anything else. Like, it's, it's an economy. An economy is this period of time in which there is an occurrence that there is a thing that happens and you just can't pin it down to the 20th century, the 19th century, the 18th century. You follow that? And it comes from the, from the Greek which is ono okonomik which is the word economy. I'm trying to find a word that I really think will work for us. It's, it's stewardship. It's here's what I'm giving you to do. The way you do it and complete it is the way that I want it done or else. And so the dispensation is God says do this. If you do this, I'll do this. Man has never been able to accomplish what God wants them, him to do. Even though when we stand in, for, in hindsight and look back at it, we realize it couldn't have been really that tough if you really understood that you were involved with God and, and what he wanted done. So we're looking at the third dispensation of government is when God gave Noah the covenant concerning the flood, allowed him to continue to multiply, gave him dominion, dominion over animals, allowing him to kill and eat animals. And this dispensation of government revealed the failure of man and their depravity and caused them to rebel against God, and they did what? They built the Tower of Babel. And you all know that story. We, they, they got together, people, of one common language, and they determined that they were going to build this ziggurat. You've seen them. They go like this. They're all step, step, step. And they were going to just walk their way to God. When they got there, they had determined they were going to be God. It didn't work like that. As you know from reading the text and the Sunday school classes you had and all this and that, God looked at that mess and he said, well, I'll fix this. And he gave them all a bunch of different languages. And because they couldn't talk with each other, they were afraid of each other, be my guess, and they dispersed. And that's the way we read it. This period was from Noah after the flood to the time of dispersion because of their diverse language. The rule of life of government was not easily obtained. And even Noah, remember this now, even Noah, with his drunkenness, Ham's sin, and the moral religious depravity point to God's judgment of sinful man. 
all God has ever asked of his people was to do what he told them to do and they turn and do the things that are evil in the sight of God. It should be noted as well that saving Adam's seed also preserved conscience and government. For this third dispensation, you're looking at scriptures in Genesis 8.20 through Genesis 11.9. How are we doing with it? Covenant, okay? The fourth dispensation of promise was given to Abraham and was not recorded until Moses. This promise contained provisions for Israel to be a great nation and receive special blessings from God. Can you see how this is breaking up into periods? And they're not necessarily 100-year blocks or 1,000-year blocks or whatever. What's the word they are? Economy. They are dispensation. This dispensation of promise is not dependent on humans. See this one? As such, it's an everlasting covenant in spite of man's sin. God finally said, well, you can't do it. I guess I will. See it? So the promise included a blessing for all the earth through Abraham in the coming of the Savior, Jesus Christ, for the propitiation of man's failure to obey God. It. You want the short version on that? Jesus had to die because we couldn't live God's moral way. So, the promise given continues into other dispensations. What you want to see in that Mosaic Covenant is once it started flowed over into other dispensations. And what flowed over was the promise of the Savior, Jesus Christ. The rule of life was to obey God and accept his blessings. That's not a hard deal to handle. Do what I tell you to and I'm going to take care of you. Some of the blessings included the promised land, spiritual blessings, divine protection. Every time the Israelite people decided they were bigger than their God and turned to idols, the protection ceased. You've read it over and over and over. I wonder if that has any application for us. If we're being blessed now and we elect not to pay attention to what God wants from us, the thought. Some of the blessings include the promised land, spiritual blessing, divine protection. Man's failure to trust God and his promise brought the law. God continued his provision of divine redemption and blessing to Israel. There was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and all their dependents demonstrated a lack of faith in God. Every one of those folks failed God. So from so far, from what we see, in these dispensations, everyone that God wanted something from, they failed him. Is that what you see? That's what I see. Sir?
We, we do continue to sin and get away from God. That's why he had to send a Savior. Is that right? Because we can't, we can't do it. We just can't handle it. So God continued his, his uh, going to his people, and his people kept going away from him. So this fourth dispensation, the scripture which applies to it, are, are uh, in Genesis 11:9 through Exodus 19:2. That brings us to the fifth dispensation. The fifth dispensation is that of law. It was given to Israel and did not affect the Gentiles. It was a temporary condition and was predicated on Israel's obedience to the law. This dispensation of law was a system of works. All the people had to do was follow the established religious requirements. How many were there? And, and we know for now, looking back at that, that they became thousands, and they couldn't even keep track of ten. And yet they determined that they, they were going to live by law. They'd just keep making new ones for God because God did, didn't know ten was enough or something like that. So the people failed the law and even forgot it. You understand that part? They just didn't bother with it anymore. The period begins with Lot and Sodom and goes through to the day of Pentecost. Got that period? All right. The rule of life was detailed religious system. You can't do this, and you can't do that, and you can't do it on one on, on the Sabbath, and you and on and on and on and on. And all the Israelite people had to do was to obey the law in its detailed system of works. So you see why, as a born again believer today, you don't get credit for works. Because works don't work. The result was continued failure. The sacrificial system was provided for restoration from sin. That's pretty cool too, isn't it? You sinned in those days. There'd come a day when the, you'd take a dove or a bull or a something or another to the priest. and He'd do his ritualistic thing and you're good for a little while. It doesn't work that way anymore. So you couldn't buy your way out of it. The law is there. You fail the law. You sin. You make a sacrifice. You do it the, the way it was prescribed to be done. And it didn't work. So however, the kings, judges, priests, and people of Israel proved the law could not bring righteousness. And I think maybe that probably had to take place just to let us know that it wouldn't work for us. Because I think the way that God planned it out from the very beginning works really well. But all you have to do is believe that Jesus Christ gave his life for you because you were not capable of doing what nece was necessary to bring you close to God. This fifth dispensation in the scriptures apply to it are Exodus 19 and verse 3 through to the cross. That brings us to the sixth dispensation of grace. Praise God. See what we've just been through in five dispensations 
and we get to this one here. It's the sixth dispensation. And it's the one that means the most to us. So the sixth dispensation relates to all people as promised in both the Old and New Testament. And as you know, the scarlet thread runs from the beginning to the end. Jesus was promised and we have him given what we call the church age and the age of grace. It is the church age and the age of grace, a period of time when God is calling both Jews and Gentiles as his people. The dispensation of grace is related to the church. The period begins at Pentecost and continues through the New Testament to the rapture of the church. The rule of life in this dispensation is grace. Grace is the church's special economy or stewardship. Let's put it another way. Grace is a gift of God. It's that window of opportunity to finally be right with God. You see how that might fit? With the coming of Christ, grace is provided and the supreme sacrifice for salvation of man takes place. So Jesus came in a very unusual way lived and died, died for us. We were grafted in as Gentiles to the Israelite nation. See how it all, you know all this stuff I'm talking about. It all fits in your head. So for this sixth dispensation, the scriptures which apply are those from the day of Pentecost. What happened on Pentecost? Holy Spirit came. And it will end at the rapture of the church. What will the rapture of the church be? Jesus will be coming. So, as I've told you before, I've cited a number of people in viewing this study, noted scholars on these theories, on this information. And many of them were authors to the book, The Meaning of the Millennium. And in doing that, they debated the merits of premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennial views. And the three views differ in circumstances surrounding the return of Christ, but are clear that Christ is returning. And for those of you who did not attend the study I finished six months ago on last things and end times, I can give you a copy of that one and you can read it. And we talked about these things, as most of you know, because you were in that class. This return takes place in the seventh dispensation. And one of these authors, Dr. Herman Hoyt, gives his view of the dispensational premillennialism. And the reason I'm citing that one is because I happen to be on that kind of thinking that premillennium is the way it might happen. And he states that a golden age of civilization, civilization or millennial kingdom will be ushered in by a divine supernatural and catastrophic manifestation from heaven at the second coming of Christ. I don't care whether I'm with him when he comes or I'm standing watching that display. It's going to be magnificent either way it goes. And if you, if you really want to see, get a, a sense of 
of that. Read that again. I think the man was right on in terms of what he said. We'll be ushered in by a divine, supernatural, and catastrophic manifestation from heaven at the second coming of Christ. You cannot part the skies and watch Jesus come where everybody's going to see him and every knee will bow and not be catastrophic. That, and if I'm standing here with my mouth open, I'll be just like those folks on the road to Emmaus. Why do you stand here gazing? Because it's going to be such a display that mind has not heard or ear seen and all that other stuff that Paul used to do. It's going to be fantastic. So with the coming of Christ... Grace is manifested by the supreme, supreme sacrifice or the salvation of man. The fulfillment of the new covenant reveals divine grace and the salvation of man, and that's Isaiah chapter 12. Old Testament. It all, it's all in there. Major prophecies deal with the dispensation of the kingdom. The period of the kingdom will begin at the second coming of Christ and will end when he establishes the new Jerusalem. The rule of life in this dispensation will be to obey the king. It'll be a whole lot easier to obey him than some of our laws. And that's on the record. It will be a theocracy. Understand that one? A theocracy? Not a democracy where you get to vote. It's going to be a theocracy where there's no vote taken. God's in charge. The fulfillment of the new covenant reveals all of God's divine grace in salvation of mankind. In spite of man's attempt to please God, this dispensation will end in a failure like all the rest. See, we won't, we'll be out of here. He will have come and got us. Those that are left are still going to have some decisions to make. For this seventh dispensation, the scripture which applies are from the second coming of Christ and will end with the destruction of the world and the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. And that's Revelations 21, 1, and 1 through 4. So one of my folks that I've quoted extensively in many of my papers is that, that uh, is Schaefer. And what Schaefer has to say is, this, is that... Um, it's what the other, many other theologians and students of the Bible have to say and that gets down to the only conclusion can be that the scriptures reveal throughout all seven dispensations that God's grace is greater than all our sin. You see it? And that's another one we knock down, isn't it? Let me pass this stuff out for you. It's called the decree of God. I have mentioned this and mentioned this and mentioned this. And Harvey said, do it. <laughs> so here it is. And we'll take a look at it. We're not going to be able to get anywhere near finishing it. It is a short one, and I will hold it. I still got two more weeks. I'm going to have to go find something else I've written. I have come to my senses, however. I, I, I think the next time I'm invited to do this, I will go back to doing Bible studies. Because I can do that. I, I can start with the first two verses of any chapter and spend six weeks there if you want me. 
That's where you all say amen. Been there, done that, haven't you? Well, I'll find something else, and we can certainly look at that. Mike came tonight. He'd already printed his off from my website. And he had, he had one all ready to go. All right. The decree of God. We have to start with the definition. There are several definitions of the decree of God that have been put forth by noted theologians, and I listed them there for you. Um, we pastors have a way of of talking about Dr. Weir's being Dr. Chriswell and and uh, you know all the big names of people like uh, MacArthur and Earl Sahadas and, and and those kinds of things and we we're citing all kinds of people. If you study what the pastor studies, you would be studying Augustus Strong, um, Lewis Schaefer. I am an old guy, so I like Rari's. Rari wrote a tremendous study Bible, the old Schofield Bible that, with the, that people used to study back in my day. My parents and them, great stuff. Many of those old writers were so right on target. And uh, so if, if, if when you hear us throwing these names around, all we're trying to do is tell you that there's been men that gave their life to just coming up with what it really, what we really need to know and give us some substance for. So they all press the same premise concerning the decree of God and though their definitions seem to vary, they are likely to be similar in at least two points. Here's the two points where they're going to be similar. First, that the decrees, notice that's plural, or decree, which you note is singular. I'm on the introduction. You all with me? And that's the decrees of our singular complete plan, the, or the decree of God is a complete plan. And second, that his plan encompasses the past, present, and future that God has decided will happen. That's your definition, and I'm going to finish it for you. Acts 15, verses 17 through 18 states, These things have been known for ages or it's translated in the King James Version in Acts 15, 18, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. According to Schaefer, decree or decrees are defined. In theology, divine decrees refer to the total plan of God which includes everything, past, present, and future, that God has determined will come to pass. And we've already discussed in one of these studies recently, like week before last or whatever, that God, in fact, knew before the world began how it was all going to play out, all the foreknowledge of God. And we'll look at some of that in addition. So what I'm trying to do is kind of give you some kind of introduction such as I did last week for the one we did tonight, and the idea being that then we can go on from there. So, if you have a de definition that you want to tack on to 
the decree of God. And I, let me see if I can do this. If I had to give you a dev definition for the decree of God, it would be His way. I am going to do this like this, and that's it. And then you take God who he is, and you say, and he knew this before I even knew I existed, and he's going to know this well into eternity. And the decree, or decrees if you prefer, is that it's God who determines how it's going to be, whether you like it or not. Old Frank Sinatra sang, sung that song, I did it my way. He's got nothing on God. Because God, in fact, is making sure that it comes out the way God wants it to be. And what we need to do is get on board with God. So, God's total plan is in according to his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, and that's Ephesians 3.11. What's God's plan? God's plan is that he's going to reconcile the world to him through Jesus Christ, Ephesians 3.11. And this plan consists of all things which God causes to occur. With me on that one? as well as those things which he permits to happen, which are caused by entities other than himself. You all don't understand that. He will bring up powers to take down disobedient followers. He did it to Israel over and over and over again, and we have been in prayer in many of the churches I've pastored that if we don't get back to God here in the USA, God's going to decide that there's a power that can take us out. Y'all been there, you're going like this. So to simply to state what the decree of God is would be to say that it is that which God determined he would permit and will permit to happen now and forever. All that is or will be is part of God's plan. And I use that word there, plan, and added decree. Decree, if you want to use a simplic, it's, it's um, what he wants to do. And it's kind of like when he started in the garden. This is what I want you to do. It's kind of like what he did in the second dispensation. This is what I want you to do. And on and on and on. And our problem, of course, is we don't want to listen to God. Let's take a moment and finish the decree. Or, stay, or, or look at decrees. An understanding of decrees should come easily when seen in the light of Ephesians 1, 1, 1, 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And then many of you in this class tonight have already been through that with me as well. We understand what that word predestined and all that stuff already has been done with. This scripture is extremely complete in its coverage of much of what we know as the decree of God. See it? It begins with God, progresses through salvation, eternal life, God's foreknowledge, his purpose, his decree. That's all in that verse right there. Within God's singular decree, all 
Although one degree covers everything, man has placed multiple decrees. Remember I told you what God's decree was? My way. But man wants to keep adding for some reason. So we pick at God's way and say, well, that's a decree, and that's a decree, and that's a decree. And so within God's singular decree, we've put multiple decrees, and it appears that several events are involved, but God determined that his decree would be all-inclusive. So this is noted in Ephesians 1.11, as previously quoted above. And let's read it again. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worked all things after the counsel of his own will. So listed below is a brief description or just a few of the decrees which make up God's decree. Those decrees selected deal mainly with God's sovereignty and man's free will as it relates to sin or salvation. Yes, sir. No, go ahead. It's the difference between God does it in one fell swoop. He says, this is my decree. This is what I have decided. And then we take and pick it apart and we say, there are decrees within his decree. And we like to separate all the little pieces out when in fact God's complete sentence as to the plan of salvation and of man is in, as I read it there, is all one sentence, basically. And so he says, this is the way it works. And we want to say, well, let's do the subpoints, and we're going to look at this and this and this and this. And so then you had the S on the end of it. It's, it's theologic, theologians who want to act like they know something. But this is what happens to it. God says, this is the way I'm going to do it. And then man comes along and says, well, let's see if we can understand a little better what he's saying. So we'll say, this is a decree, this is a decree, this is a decree. When in fact, those decrees are all part and parcel of his decree. And I got it? Good. So we go over then. You are at um, Ephesians on the science, any way you want to pronounce it. When one thinks of the sovereignty of God, one must be aware that his sovereignty encompasses or contains the complete knowledge concerning all things. The divine foreknowledge. In eternity, nothing existed except the divine mind. Thus, nothing exists without God's prior knowledge. Do you understand that one? In, the, in, in God's startup, if that was ever a startup, which it wasn't, because he's from all eternity to all eternity. When you, when you look at his foreknowledge, it was before our knowledge. We couldn't have our knowledge without his knowledge. He knows all. And, and what he's given us to be who we are is all part of his foreknowledge. And so when we look at divine foreknowledge, we're looking at nothing existed apart from him. God knows everything and the order in which it will occur and an action or an event. There is nothing that's going to happen that God does not already know about. He knew when you were going to stump your toe for the first time. He knew when you were going to fail him for the first time. You all with me? Nothing is not he knows it all, all the time, always has, always will, forever and ever. Amen. That's foreknowledge of God. His foreknowledge of sin demonstrates his foreknowledge of the necessity of the cross 
as a redemption for sin. I look at that and I say, there must have been another way. But the given is, is that there probably was not another way. If that was God's choice and the way it had to be done, then it had to be the way. And we would like to second guess God. But the given is, is that his foreknowledge of what sin was all about made him determine that he himself, represented by Christ, would have to give a sacrifice ultimately that no one or anyone or anything could ever do. And he gave of himself for us. That's the foreknowledge of God that he had to deal with our mistake and pay the price. There had to be a redemption. There was a debt owed. There had to be a debt paid. And we're looking at that the cross was an absolute necessity. God's divine and infinite wisdom has provided a plan to cover all circumstances. No matter what your sin, God's got it covered. Yes. Yes, we, you know, we're being who we are, not being God. We don't have anything to give. You know, and so, it, it just, for me, it's such an incredible idea that, that we have a God that will, he gave himself. You know, and, and of course, the questions asked in the Bible, you know, would would somebody with, as a great adventure give his life? You know, but Christ gave his life that all of us might have eternal life. It's such an incredible thing. I, I've been preaching a long time, and I've I've seen lives change. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus makes a difference. And, and some of you, let's put it this way. I know what I was. I would like to think I'm a little better than that today because Jesus loves me. You know, I, I know where I've been. I know what I've done. And I've talked to a lot of preachers. And if anybody knows about sin, it's a bunch of preachers. Okay? Because they've been there, done that. Not for the practice, but because they, it's just the way life leads us sometimes. We do things we probably shouldn't do. But thank God for Calvary. Because Jesus paid it all. So we'll take up this thing again next week at Divine Immutability. And you can go ahead and read it and find out what Divine Immutability is. If you wonder why I use all these big words, it's because it's okay for you to hear it. Paul said, get off the mountain, get on to the meat. Well, some of this is meat. <laughs>